Good evening, ladies as well as gentlemen. I'm Papa Boris here playing some more chess, and this video I view as a kind of public service a, uh, because I'm going to show you a way to play against one of the most obnoxious openings in the history of chess, the fried liver attack. Uh, this game that I'm about to show you was played in 1890 between Jay Rainish and Carol Traxler. Nothing is really known about who this Jay Rainish person was. It might have been a figment of somebody's imagination, but I have not found any, any conclusive evidence that this game was a composition, so it does appear to have been a real game, and if so, it was the first recorded instance of the Traxler counterattack. So before we get to that, I have to show you what the fried liver attack is, if you haven't seen it before. After e4 and e5... Knight f3, knight c6, and bishop c4. Rainish starts the Italian game. Uh, there's two main ways black can continue. One is bishop to c5, in which case, at the time, a very popular continuation was before the Evans gambit. Now, uh, this is not like winning or anything for white. In fact, engines give black a slight advantage, but it does sacrifice a pawn to gain a lot of activity. So if you don't want to let white do this, you can play what? Traxler played in this game, which was knight to f6. But that allows another move, knight to g5, thus beginning what is called the fried liver attack. Um, the idea here is that because black just went to f6 with his knight, it actually blocks the black queen's attack on g5, enabling the white knight to hop in there. And now the white knight and bishop are both attacking f7, and it's weirdly difficult to defend that pawn. The first time that you see this, you are probably going to find d5 blocking the bishop, and after e takes d5, you'll probably innocently reply with knight takes d5, attacking this knight and continuing to block the bishop's eyesight on f7. I still remember this when I was a kid, being rudely surprised by the continuation knight takes f7, a peace sacrifice. This forks the queen and rook, so you have no choice but to take the knight. And then white plays queen to f3, which forks the king and the knight. Now, at this point, if you want to hang on to your piece, you have to play king to e6. This is the best continuation for black, and white is a slight advantage here. The attack is not decisive, but white definitely has compensation for the piece, and the engine even considers white better. Honestly, if you're black, I mean, who wants to deal with this crap? Honestly, it's just terrible to play. So, um, if you don't want to keep the piece, then things get pretty bad in a hurry. Um, if you play king to g8, it's actually hilarious. It's a forced mate in three, because after the check, you're embarrassingly getting mated here by a single white piece. And if you retreat with king to e8, well, then white just takes the bishop, or takes the knight back with the bishop. So now the material is equal. White is up a pawn, and black has zero compensation for this pawn, plus the black king has moved and so therefore cannot castle. It's not a great situation. Now, one thing that's really annoying about this whole fried liver thing is that uh, when I was a kid, uh, I went to chess camps in late elementary school and uh, middle school, and I remember the chess masters who ran the camp showed us a refutation of the fried liver attack, which is instead of taking on d5 with a knight, you hear play knight to a5. Now, the black knight attacks both squares from which the white bishop could keep an eye on f7, so white here plays bishop to b5 check. After c6, pawn takes, pawn takes, the bishop moves back, and the masters who ran the camp said that this was a refutation of the fried liver attack. Baloney! That is a lie. This position is perfectly fine for white. Notice, first of all, that white is up a pawn. He's got seven pawns to six. White's pawn structure is also pristine, whereas black's is shattered. And black has this stupid knight on a5 doing nothing. Black does not have a lead in development. He doesn't really have anything whatsoever for the lost pawn, and white's just about to castle and carry on with the game. So that's what's really maddening, that you'd think, okay, that this move over here, knight to g5, which is, which is such a douchebag move, would be punishable somehow, moving the same piece twice in the opening, trying to get this cheap shot on f7. Like, you'd think there's got to be some way for black to refute this, and there isn't. The uh, According to opening theory, the only so-called refutation which, uh, you know, results in this perfectly fine position for white is not even that bad. So it's like white got to get away with murder. He got to have it, his cake and eat it. He got to go for the cheap shot and maybe win if black doesn't know how to defend it right. And even if black does know how to defend it right, then white's still doing great.
I do just want to show one more thing here. When I was a kid, people often played bishop to a4 here, which is a logical move. Keeps the, you know, pin on the pawn, keeps the knight chained to the pawn. This actually is a mistake. Black is way, way, way better here. So uh, if, you, if you were troubled by this like, uh, like I was when I was a kid, you should know how to continue playing. The key is don't get tripped up. Don't try to rush to resolve this situation with the pawn and knight. Just ignore that. Kick the white knight back and then kick the knight again. Now the knight doesn't have any good moves. So uh, the best continuation here for white might be to play queen to e2, pinning the pawn to the king. So you just ignore that. You play bishop to c5, and then after white castles um, and black castles, with the king vacated from e8, taking the knight on f3 is a real threat, and white has to move the knight back. And there's really no way for white to avoid this. If white tries something like d3 back here, trying to get rid of this pawn, uh, you can actually play bishop to a6 and pin this pawn to the queen. And then again, after castling, castling, the knight's under attack, and white has to push the knight back. So this is a great position for black. All of black's pieces are developed. He's castled. White still has all these undeveloped pieces over here on the queen side, and this is totally fine. Uh, but... The mistake that white made is going back to a4. If instead of going back to a4, white knows what he's doing and goes back to d3, then white has a perfectly fine game. So well, everything I'm about to say from this point is complete fiction, okay? It's total fabrication on my part. It's just something that, you know, I, I like to imagine. I like to imagine that Carol Traxler was this grumpy old pissed off German guy who was just sick and tired of this knight g5 shit. So one day he stayed up all night in his secret underground German laboratory cooking up a defense, muttering under his breath like, I'm gonna get those kids. And then he finally came up with something and then poor Jay Rainish, whoever he was, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so he was the first person in the world to witness Bishop C5, the Traxler counterattack. Now what the hell's up with this move? Well, first of all, black is planning to castle, after which this f7 pawn will be protected, and this knight on g5 will be totally stupid. So if white's going to take on f7, he better do it now. So he does. At this point, black has sacrificed a rook, effectively, because after the queen moves, the knight will take the rook. But Traxler has no intention of playing nice. He plays bishop takes f2, sacrificing a bishop to go along with his sacrifice of the rook. And now the tables have turned! Okay, now it's white who has to play correctly or else get cra or else get smashed. To be fair, this sacrifice is not sound. Okay, with perfect play from white, white will come out of this in a better position. But it is difficult to figure out how to play this correctly for white, especially if you've never seen this before. Now, you don't really want to take on f2 because this allows knight takes e4 with check. And this opens up the black queen's ability to come to h4, which is a square that it would love to be on. After the king goes back, say, to f1, queen to h4 threatens checkmate on f2, and now the tables have turned. Suddenly, white has a threat that's really oddly difficult to counter. If you block the threat like this, uh, and you're playing this as black, make sure that you know this tactic, knight to g3. So the idea is that that opens up the queen's attack on the bishop. So after the knight is captured, you can take the bishop with check. And the best part is after that, you can actually hop back over and take the knight. And so now you have the better position. You're up the pawn. And other than that, material and development are all equal. And it was the white king that moved around, not yours. So this is just awesome for black and a fantastic way to turn the tables on that asshole white who is going for this fried liver garbage. Um, now, this opponent, Jay Rainish, Jay Ren Rainish, Rainish, whatever, uh, he realized that taking the bishop wasn't that great, and now the white king has two places to move, f1 or e2. The correct place is f1, Rainish chose e2, which is wrong. The reason that's wrong is it allows knight to d4 check. Now, at this point, you definitely don't want to take the bishop or move to f1. That feels, hashtag feels bad, man, because, like, you could have done that last time, only now there's also a black knight on d4, so clearly it would have been better if you are going to do that to do it without letting the black knight come closer to your king. So uh, it's still actually better at this point just to, take, just to take the bishop and realize you made a mistake. But uh, Reinish decided the only way through was forward, and he played king to d3. And at this point, black is officially winning the game. It, it's, it's over. White has lost it. Um, uh, Traxler found a very poetic way to continue. Black's just winning after he plays king, queen to e7. Um, but uh, Traxler decided to uh, prolong white's suffering with b5. 
Okay, and now you don't really want to take the queen here because after b takes c4, king takes, and the bishop comes here with check, what's quite interesting is that uh, the bishop can come to e2, and white's queen is trapped. All these squares are covered by bishops. So black gets the material back, and the white king is in a ridiculous position. So you don't want to take the queen here. Um, Reinish, to his credit, saw that, and he retreated the bishop to b3. Uh, but then Traxler continued with another amazing move. By the way, queen to e7, totally fine, still completely winning. But Traxler found knight takes e4. So he sacrificed a rook. He then sacrificed a bishop. By moving his pawn and knight, he effectively sacrificed a queen, and he's also sacrificing a knight. So he's, like, sacrificed a bunch of pieces this game, although none of the sacrifices have actually been taken yet. If you take the knight, there's actually a forced mate, beginning with d5 check. Uh, and there's no way to get out of mate here. If you try taking the pawn with your bishop, then black gets the mate in with bishop to f5. The white king actually doesn't have anywhere to go except to take the pawn on e5. And then we have queen to f6 check. Only one square to run, which is queen to or which is king to f4. And then bishop takes c2, wraps things up. After king to g4, we have this very pretty mate, queen to h4, where both of the white king's flight squares are covered by black's knight. So there's no dreams of taking the pawn with the bishop. What else can you do? Well, the white king has two places to go. He can go to e5 or he can go to d3. If he goes to e5, this is a very quick checkmate after knight to c6 check. The king only has one square he can go to, which is f4, and then queen to f6 is actually a checkmate. Quite pretty, these two flight squares covered by the bishop and the pawn. If the king, instead of taking on e5, goes back to d3, this is the longest enforced mate sequence, but then there's bishop to f5 check. Now the king only has a single move, which is c3, then black plays knight to e2. White can either take the knight or go to b4, but the thing is this knight's actually not important. All it's doing when it goes to e2 is vacating the d4 square. So let's say you take the knight, then bishop to d4 check, king to b4, and a5 check. Now, if you go to a3, you get, uh, whoops, nope, you get checkmated in the corner with the bishop, there we go. And if you take this pawn, then you get checkmated with this other bishop on d7, these raking bishops covering most of the white king's squares. So all that is by way of saying that back here, um, white cannot take this knight, because d5 is forced checkmate in all variations. Not knowing what else to do, white decided to take the queen, on d8, and here we again will have a forced checkmate. Uh, Bla Black is just winning the game at this point, no matter what white does, but uh, this option by Reinish chose, uh, the, this option that Reinish chose led to a very pretty finish to the game. After knight to c5 check, the king had no choice but to move to c3, and then after knight to e2 check, we see a similar theme as we saw in one of the other variations. This check doesn't actually do anything except vacate the d4 square for the bishop. So after the queen took the knight, we had bishop to d4 check, king only has one move, which is to b4, and now a5 check. So here, if the king goes to a3, it gets checkmated right away. So Reinish played king takes b5, and now we have bishop to a6 check. So here, the king only has a single option, which is to take the pawn on a5, and black could have taken the queen on e2, but he decided to play bishop to d3 for style points and not take the white queen. The king has to now go back to b4, and what's happening here is that this knight is actually in the way. It's like black has too many, black has already sacrificed a couple of pieces, but he's got too many pieces now. He really wants to play c5, checkmate. So at this point, the next few moves are just a maneuver to get the knight out of, out of the picture. After knight to a6 check, the white king has three different squares you could go to, but all of them fail. If king to a3, then bishop to c5 check, and after king to a4, knight to b4 is checkmate. Um, Reinish played king to a4. Note that a4 and a5 produce the exact same continuation, which is knight to b4 check, sacrificing that knight. The king must take it, he has no other moves, and now this is the exact same position as we had a few moves ago, except the c5 square has been vacated. So now c5 is checkmate. And so that, my friends, is how you can respond to white douchebags who play the fried liver attack, the Traxler counterattack. And it has been played, in some cases, even by some notable players, such as uh, Russell Limo, for example, played this to great effect. Uh, and in a lot of different variations, the white players, even though an engine says white is doing fine or even better, white players could not find the proper defense because it is a very difficult attack to play against and completely turns the tables on white.
Hope you enjoyed it. Please like and or subscribe if you did, and I'll see you again soon. Take care, everybody.